Genesis 49, if you will, please. You're turning to Genesis 49, and uh, we meet there the 12 sons that are born over a period of about 23 years. And they have four mothers. 23 years in bringing them forth, 12 guys, 12 boys, four moms produced them. I can picture them in maybe a semicircle around the bed of uh, their dying father, Jacob, in their birth order. And I'm also wondering what's going through their minds as they know what this is about. What thoughts are bombarding uh, their thoughts? Perhaps they're thinking, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen to us after he dies. I'm sure that thought came to their mind. Maybe they were thinking, how long are we going to end up staying here in Egypt now that Father's dying? They were probably also wondering, who's really going to get the birthright? These 12 sons of Jacob are the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so when you think of it that way, what happens here around the bed of dying Jacob is really the basis for the rest of the Bible story because it all stems from this. Chapter 49 really provides us prophetic insight into the Jewish ancestors and uh, it significantly explains to us the history of Israel. I think we'll see that. In Jewish tradition, each tribe has been given a symbol that can actually be traced back here to Jacob's prophecy, his prophetic blessing of his sons. And uh, a blessing really that also touches on each of these boys character as well totally connected to that but for instance the uh, the symbol for the tribe of Dan is a wolf head the symbol for the tribe of Judah is a lion head you get the picture and it's all related to what is, is said here in these verses which we've already read but I want to share with you I hope what will be some practical lessons from the lives of these men. I'm not going to look at each of them in detail. There wouldn't be enough time to do that. And I don't want to get bogged down in that, but I want to touch some high spots here that uh, can, I think, give us understanding and uh, application to our own lives. Let's pause a moment and pray first. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that we can come into your presence this morning and we can depend upon you to undertake for us. I Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are that blessed, promised power of Pentecost. I accept that unction from you and thank you for undertaking for me. And pray that you will give that same unction to the hearers, wherever we might be, that uh, we might get from the scripture this day precisely what you intend and of course, for your glory, we pray it. Amen. I want you to look at the first seven verses. I'm quickly going to review them here for you. Look at it. Jacob calls his sons, and he says, Notice this. Gather yourselves together that I may tell you, look at this line, that which shall befall you in the last day. So that clues us in right away. This is prophetic. Jacob is functioning as a prophet here. That's important to remember because in a moment we're going to talk about uh, the prophetic uh, aspect of this. But I want you to look at the first uh, three boys that he touches on in uh, verses, uh, I think it's uh, three to seven. Yeah, the first one is Reuben. He's the firstborn. He should have got the whole shooting match. 
He should have got everything. He should have received the double portion as the firstborn son. He should have received the leadership, the, 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 rule, the role of leadership in that family. But he didn't. He didn't. Why? Look at verse 4. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, thou defilest it. He went up to my couch. Okay, that's the firstborn, Reuben. The next two, Simeon and Levi. Two brothers. The next two in line, they're called instruments of cruelty in their habitations. Do you remember why? Well, we're told in their anger, verse 7, in their wrath, they were so cruel that they, remember, wiped out an entire city. Wiped out an entire village because the prince in that city raped their sister. And so that was their revenge. So, with that said, let me give you my first main point today. And that is this. In these three boys, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, I see a problem with passions. There's a passion problem here. And I see in them also two causes of or guarantees for personal problems and family problems that will ruin you and your family. And those two things are simply this. Uncontrolled lust and uncontrolled anger. It'll ruin you, it'll ruin your family. Uncontrolled lust and uncontrolled anger. Problem with passions. Those are major flaws in these three boys and those are major flaws in a person's life. But as I said here, Jacob is pronouncing blessings on all 12 of his boys. I say that based upon what we read in, uh, uh, for example, the 28th verse. We read uh, this regarding Jacob's blessing. These are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is that their fathers spake unto them and blessed them. Every one, according to his blessing, he blessed them. You say... Sounds to me, sounds to me like some of them got the dirty end of the stick. Sounds to me like some of them weren't blessed but cursed, right? Well, uh, in a sense, there is uh, that. But here is how that can be a blessing. When correction and warning is received by the person to which it is being offered, it can actually turn into a blessing if that person listens and learns from it. So you can take a bad situation, you can take a major problem, a major flaw in your life, a problem with passions as we see here, and if you will listen and learn, that curse can be turned into a blessing actually. And so Jacob is actually blessing these boys even though there are limitations that he pronounces upon them. First of all, Reuben, because of his uncontrolled lust, he's the firstborn. He would be designated to be the natural leader in the family and inherit the double portion of the family blessing. But listen how it is explained by the, uh, the uh, history uh, uh, recorder in First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Listen as I read. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after, his, after the birthright. Judah prevailed above his brethren, above Reuben. And of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Break that all down. Basically what he's saying is, what Reuben should have received, he did not receive. He did not get the birthright, nor did he get the double portion. He did not get the rulership uh, in the family. 
simply because of his uncontrolled lust. You say, what is that? Well, we could go back. We're not going to do that. We could go back to a former chapter in the book of Genesis where we read that this oldest son of Jacob had an affair with a surrogate uh, mother. I said there was four moms that brought forth these 12 boys. He had an affair with... uh, his mother's uh, maid, and uh, as a result, this is what comes upon him. That happened 20 years before this deathbed blessing. 20 years before. Why did he do it? Well, it was uncontrolled lust, but there also may have been other areas of selfishness in his life. You see, in that day, uh, you could cement and uh, you could uh, you could Uh, you could try to solidly grab your position and your power as the firstborn through this kind of behavior. Of course, that's no excuse. And I think what it tells us is that there is a very, very high cost to just having a moment of pleasure. And again, it may have been more than just pleasure that he was seeking. I understand that. Maybe position of power as well, but whatever. There is a very high cost for that. Sexual immorality disqualified this boy from the firstborn position that rightfully was his otherwise. And there are consequences that impacted his descendants as well. I mean, it continues on down the line. In fact, he is called in this passage by his father as very unstable. James says that a, uh, that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What is a double-minded man? A double-minded person is a person that lives for self and tries to live for God at the same time. He's unstable, uh, Jacob says. And really, that instability marks his tribe. The tribe of Re- the Reubenites are marked by their instability. In fact, Here he is, the firstborn, but his tribe produces no significant leader in all of Israel's history. Uncontrolled lust. Young men, especially. All but young men and men in general. We must have God's control over that sexual drive. We can't let lust be unrestrained in our thought life where it begins and then of course in our actions in fact Jesus says that the thought life is just as important as the actions of life because he says a man commits adultery in his heart before he ever does it in an act problem with passions I'm sure that we we can point our finger at Reuben, but what about us? What about the uncontrolled lust in our own lives? We need to deal with that. We need to own that. We need to have God deliver us. We need his victory over that area in our life. That is key in a walk with God. Secondly, these two brothers, Simeon and Levi, they have a problem with passions. In their case, it's not uncontrolled lust. In their case, it's uncontrolled anger. They're partners in crime. They become unhinged hotheads. In fact, the book of uh, uh, the, the Proverbs Uh, say something to this effect, that a person that does not have rule over their own spirit, over their human spirit, is like a city that is broken down without walls. And an ancient city, broken down and without walls, is a city in ruins. And it's useless. It's been conquered. It's captive. If you do not have God's control over your anger. You're a captive. You're conquered. 
You either conquer your anger or your anger conquers you and holds you slave to it. These two brothers show uncontrolled anger. You know, it's right to be angry sometimes at the right thing, right? In fact, the Bible says be angry, but in your anger don't sin. Don't exercise sinful anger. There is a right kind of anger. Because if we don't exercise the right kind of anger, the Bible says we give place to the devil. And when the devil gets a foothold in anyone's life through anger, he wreaks havoc. Let me tell you, I can say that from personal experience. There are times for anger, but what I have found in my own experience is that often the time for anger is off in my life. <laughs> I don't get it right. I don't get the right timing for it. But there is a time for proper anger. What happens as a result of this? Notice he, he says in that, uh, that 49th chapter about these two brothers, because of their anger, he says in verse 7, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. They would be distanced from their other family members, from their extended family. You know, the Bible also says, do not make friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, go thou not. Don't hang around angry people. Don't hang out with people that are full of bitterness and anger because it is catchy. You talk about uh, contagious. And you know what? It could very well be more deadly than COVID-19. Did you know there's things that perhaps are more deadly than that? More infectious than that? And yet, what kind of a mask do we wear regarding the holding back or the controlling of the infection of lust and of anger in our life? Uncontrolled. He says, it'll disqualify you. It, uh, it will set you on the shelf. Uh, you'll not uh, be really of much use for God. I know of a pastor that uh, was an excellent Bible teacher, a great expositor, but he was an angry man and uh, couldn't get along with people. And as a result, even though he was very gifted and talented, he left uh, a lot of damage in the wake, a lot of ruin, uncontrolled anger of these guys. Now. Let me reiterate this. You can turn a curse into a blessing. This Levi, this son that was so cruel, remember at the worship of the golden calf, at the end when Moses says, who's on the Lord's side? Guess what? Levi, his descendants stood and they did the work of the Lord. And as a result, they then are the chosen tribe that served in the tabernacle and in the temple, they are the priesthood. And so that curse actually in some ways was a blessing. They were scattered in Israel. They weren't given a, a tribal allotment, but rather there were 48 cities throughout the land of Israel that the Levites dwelt in, scattered through Israel just as Jacob had prophesied. So, problem with passions, first seven verses. Uncontrolled lust and uncontrolled anger. And folks, that is right down where we live. Human nature never changes. Here's the second thing I want to bring to your attention. Go back to verse 1 again. I want to remind you, he, Jacob says, Gather yourselves together, I, that I may tell you that which will befall you in the last days. And then again, uh, sort of reiterated in the uh, 28th verse, all these things 
are not just the twelve sons of Jacob, but the twelve son, but the twelve tribes of Israel. So, these prophecies are just that. There is not only problem with passions here, but there is a facing the future here. And that's what I see in all of these uh, blessings that uh, Jacob says concerning his sons. It's a prophetic look, not merely at these boys, but at their descendants. And it reveals how circumstances all fit into God's plan and how parents impact their descendants as well. This is an important part of the Christian life. This is such an important part of Christianity, how you and I impact future generations. This is why we have to take our Christian life really serious. And I want you to see here, as we look at facing the future in these uh, prophetic utterances of, uh, that he gives for his sons, I want you, first of all, to see it as history. Because while it was prophetic uh, to them, it's history to us as we look back on it. And I'm sure you've heard it said, because I know I've said it and I heard it other places, that history is his story. History is all about God. History is, you need to recognize and then apply the fact that history is nothing else and this prophetic history that is given here is nothing else than a revelation of God's plan for humanity. And so whatever is happening now, or in the past, or will happen in the future, guess what? We have hope. It doesn't matter how bleak it looks. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. In a sense, we have hope because we know that it is all working towards one glorious end and God's the winner. And God's plan is going to reign supreme. And he's going to set everything right on this earth one day. In fact, he's going to rework this earth. And just as you and I are new creations, this earth is going to be a new creation. And so we have hope as we think about prophecy and history. But I want you, as we... Uh, think along those lines, to also then see sovereignty, that God controls history, that God controls events, that God controls everything. And uh, you don't have to understand Bible prophecy perfectly. No one does anyway. I don't. But what you must do is you must trust God completely. And that's what it's about that you see the sovereignty of God in everything, in every age of human history, in that which has already happened, that which is happening now, and that which will happen yet in the future. That you see a sovereign God in control of everyone and all events, and you think, how could that be? How could things like this be happening if God is in control? Because he is in control. And this is what he said he is going to permit and he is going to allow to bring it all to a crescendo. So trust the God that has everything under his control. Don't get all upset. Don't allow uncontrolled anger to fill your heart because of don't fret yourself because of evildoers. Don't get caught up in, in all of those uh, uh, movements that are seeking to do this, that, and that. Pray like you've never prayed before. Pray for the evil, uh, the evil one, his wicked plans to fail. But trust sovereignty in history. And there is also personality in these different boys that are that prophecies are spoken uh, about. There is Dan, for instance. Dan is the son of a surrogate wife of, Joseph, uh, of Jacob. But you know what's interesting to me? Even though he's not, he's from a surrogate mother, he still gets a full inheritance. Dan does. 
which tells me this. There is personality involved in facing the future. That you, as an individual, have a unique and a, a, a personal contribution to this present day that you are alive and that God has given you life. God has something in mind or you wouldn't be here. And as long as you're here, regardless of your physical condition, as long as you're here, God has a purpose for you to be here. And you need to find out, if you haven't already, why. What's his unique contribution that he wants you to be a part of? You know, God has a unique place for you. He has something for you that he has not given to anyone else. He's created you as a personality that he wants to use. Are you willing for him to place you where he will? That you can make that unique contribution. You know, each one of us complement the work of the Lord. We're not in competition, but we complement the work of the Lord. And so do other churches, and so do other pastors, and so do other Christians. We complement, we're not in competition. We're all doing the work of the Lord. And we need to see ourselves as that particular personality that God created us to. Don't try to be me, and I'm not going to try to be you. Don't try to be someone else. Just be the person that God created you to be. And just say, Lord, you know who I am. You made me as I am. Now, Lord, use me as you see fit. Here I am. These boys. It's about personality here. But here's the... the real important point that I want you to get in facing the future. In history and prophecy there is that centrality and that centrality is that God's plan centers in Jesus. God's plan centers in Jesus the Messiah. Not in events. Not even in prophetic events. Not in historical events. But in Jesus his person. I want you to see with me uh, verse 10. This is uh, a reference to Judah and his descendants. It says in verse 10, the scepter, that is the instrument that stands or symbolizes rulership, kingship, leadership. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh or Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now I want you to note this. Shiloh. Shiloh is not an event. Shiloh is a person. In fact it's difficult to actually translate that, uh, that proper noun Shiloh. It is the contraction of two Hebrew words that as best as we can tell means he to whom he to whom meaning the one to whom leadership or kingship belongs or some believe that Shiloh is a proper name for Messiah and it is from a root word a Hebrew stem that means to be quiet or to be at rest. And it shares the same root as the Hebrew word shalom. Shiloh. Notice Judah, he got, he got the firstborn leadership role. He is the kingly line, Judah. The king comes out of Judah. The Messiah comes out of Judah. It would be the line of Judah that would produce Messiah. And Jacob expresses a very interesting desire in verse 18. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. You know what's interesting and important? The word salvation in Hebrew is the word that we get the word Yeshua from. I have waited for thy Yeshua. Oh Lord, he says in that verse. And I think that uh, it's even more significant when you put 
verse 17 with it, where Jacob says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels. Now think about two words in that 17th verse. Think of the word serpent and the word heels. Where were those two words first found in the book of Genesis? Way back, way back in the Garden of Eden, in Adam and Eve, after they sinned, and God pronounced a curse on the woman, he pronounced a curse on the serpent. And he said that the serpent would nip the, the, the woman's seed, nip the heel of the woman's seed, but that the woman's seed would crush the head of the serpent. That's the first gospel message in the entire Bible. There it is, right there in Genesis 3.15. And I think that there is an allusion in Jacob's words about Dan to that. You know, Dan was a tribe that led the northern tribes of Israel into idolatry. They were an idolatrous tribe. In fact, they're not mentioned in the 12 tribes in Revelation chapter 7. You'll note that Dan is missing there. But at the same time, what we have here is the fact that Jacob has that longing. I think that clearly says uh, in what verse 18, he has in mind that one through, uh, th that would crush the serpent's head and crush the idolatry. Well, that leads us to one more thing about facing the future that I want to say, and that is responsibility. Everyone needs a proper response to God's plan. They did, you do. We all must have a proper response to the plan of God. And you know what? Your response is a personal choice on your part to either cooperate and participate and enjoy God's blessing as a result, or to refuse to be a part of it, to reject it. Too many people are rejecting God's plan. I trust we're not. I trust our desire is to cooperate with God's plan. Our proper response is, yes, Lord, we want to be a part of what you're doing. We want to be participants with you. Then there's one last thing that I want to point to, and it has to do with the blessing on Joseph. So jump down with me in this chapter to verse 22. Here Joseph is said to be a fruitful branch. A fruitful branch by a well. In other words, it's, it's getting uh, nourishment, it's getting uh, water. Whose branches run over the wall. It's, it's uh, much fruit. And the archers have sorely grieved him. We know what that means, right? Joseph suffered. But his bow abode in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong. How? By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, who is also called the shepherd and the stone of Israel. Here is the bestowing of blessing. I mean, like you've never seen it before. What we have in verses 23 and 24 is just a brief biography of Joseph. A little bit of... Uh, who he was and what happened to him. But the thing to keep in mind is, despite the fact that as this uh, scripture says, he's been sorely grieved. The archers have sorely, they've shot at him, they've hated him, they've hit him with their arrows. Joseph, he remained steadfast. Joseph was faithful. He was unshaken in his trust of God. And that's incredible, because we're talking about a man that didn't have a Bible in his hand like you and I do. He couldn't look for Bible promises that would get him through his rough, his rough uh, patches in life, right? We have so much at our fingertips. We have so much available to us. We have so much knowledge that Joseph never had, except what God gave him in vision and dreams. God spoke to this man. I understand that. And because God spoke to him, he believed God, he was unshaken in his trust of God, regardless of what God allowed ha to happen to him. And he had a lot of injustice doled out to him. A lot of horrible things he never deserved. 
There's nothing really that you can see in the life of Joseph that really is a glaring sin. And yet look at what he endured. And yet his trust in God is unshaken through it all. He is a fruitful bough, uh, we are told, or a fruitful branch. He got the firstborn double portion. He produced two tribes. Remember? Ephraim and Manasseh. And they became Joseph's inheritance. Those two boys are named among the twelve tribes of Israel. In verses 25 and 26, count how many times the word bless or blessing appears. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors under the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Six times the word bless or blessings are found in those just those two verses there. It's his father's words to his son Joseph. The powerful words. I don't think that parents, and dads in particular, really grasp the tremendous power of your words to influence your family. So important. There are words that your father, your parents have spoken to you whether they be good words or bad words that you never forgot. They stick with you all of your life. You, don't, uh, you, you and I have to understand the power of our words and the unique and tremendous influence that dads especially, so that we're careful to impart blessing to our children. I don't know if any of you remember Pete Rose. He was a famous... Uh, baseball player, but years ago when Pete Rose broke Ty Cobb's long-standing record for the most career hits, a reporter asked Rose what he thought about as he stood on that base with the whole stadium standing up, giving him a, a, a standing ovation, cheering wildly. And here's what he said. He said that he thought that his dad was probably looking down from heaven and was pleased with him. Of all the things that Pete Rose could think at that moment, as a grown man, he was still thinking about his father's approval. Now whether he had his father's approval in his young life, I don't know. But I find that significant, that that mattered to him as a grown-up. Joseph, in verse 24 is described as a, as a boy with a bow and arrow but not strong enough to pull it back. The strength of the, of the bow strength too strong for him and so it says he, his uh, hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. By the help of Jacob's God. And I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the blessing that Jacob is bestowing upon Joseph and our responsibility to bestow blessing upon others. And I'm thinking especially as a parent or as a father. But just in general, how do you bestow blessing upon anyone, your family members? I think uh, several things I want to leave you with. Number one, you have to instill in them God's viewpoint. You have to give them God's perspective on life. God's viewpoint of what it means to be fruitful. Jacob was called, or, or Joseph was called by Jacob, a fruitful branch. A branch that produced more fruit. It was running over. It was abundant fruit. It's really a picture of the abundant life, isn't it? A fruitful life. John 15 all over again. 
He's fr you know what fruitfulness is in a believing life? God's viewpoint. That's success. We shouldn't train our children for financial success as much as we should train them for spiritual fruitfulness. And when you look in John chapter 15, fruitfulness is the result of the abiding life. And that abiding or abundant life is a life that obeys God because it is dependent upon God to enable them to obey Him. And the fruit that is being spoken of in John 15 is not the fruit of the Spirit as in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but rather the fruit of bringing people to Jesus, reproducing ourselves as witnesses for Him. That's the spiritual fruit there. And that is God's viewpoint of fruitfulness that we need to pass on to our children and to others if we're going to bestow a blessing on them. And not only that, we need to give them God's viewpoint of strength. How do you do that? You need to model it and you need to teach it. Model it and teach it to others to recognize your own weakness. Admit your own strengthlessness, your own inability. In fact, you'll never have the strength of God in your life that you so desperately need until you own your own absolute strengthlessness. He gives power to them that have no strength, Isaiah says. Recognize your weakness and you'll set yourself up and others for dependence upon God's strength, dependence upon God's grace. You need to teach your children how to depend upon God for his strength because they need to find out earlier, sooner than later, their strength is insufficient. It won't work. Give them God's viewpoint of trials. The trials are part of God's purpose for life. That's the way fruit is produced. You can't have fruit unless the branch has been pruned and trials are the pruning of the branch. If you want success in the Christian life, you want more fruit, then you, gotta, you have to have God's viewpoint, His purpose for your trials. And I see it so clearly in the book of 2 Corinthians as I'm reading, I happen to be reading through this book uh, currently and it, uh, it really hit me uh, once again in chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11 where uh, Paul says, all, uh, we're always talking about him and his, his team. We've been persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, not destroyed. We're always bearing about in our human body the dying of the Lord Jesus. In other words, our life is, is a living sacrifice and we're ready to lay it on the altar, literally. We're, a, we're willing to give it up at any moment if it would advance the cause of Christ. We always bear in our body the dying of our Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. He's talking about suffering for Christ. And my life is always in danger, he says, because I preach the gospel. But he said that's okay. Because it's through that that the life of Jesus is made manifest. So death works in us, but life in you. Do you understand? That's God's viewpoint of your trials. Suffering for Jesus' sake, God's viewpoint is that dying is what produces his life. Do you have that viewpoint yourself? If you don't, you'll never be able to pass it on to your children or your children's children. And then I think, not only if you're going to be bestowing blessing on others, you need to communicate God's viewpoint on these things, but you need a walk with God. I mean a real walking with God that is consistent. It's not on again and off again all the time. It's consistent. That you live an abiding life. That you depend upon God for obedience to His Word. That's how you do it. 
You can't. He can. This is what he says. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the commandment. Well, how do you do that? Lord, your love through me to them. Walk with God. And look at the God that he uh, talks about in, in this uh, verse uh, 24. The mighty God, notice the names, the mighty God of Jacob, the shepherd, how often that appears in Scripture, right? And Jesus is the epitome of it all. He's the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd of the sheep, Peter says. And then the stone, the stone of Israel. Remember that rock that Moses smote water was able to refresh the souls of millions of people. Paul tells us that rock was Christ. That was... That, that represented the spiritual living water that issues out of Jesus. Your walk with the Lord, with Him, the mighty God, the shepherd, the stone. And then just some important points in bestowing blessing. You have to know the people that you want to bless. Not all kids are the same. Oh, they have some similar characteristics, but every child is different. And you need to know the differences. You need to know that child. Their strong points and their weak points. You need to point out their strengths. You need to show them their weaknesses. There needs to be that reproof. There needs to be that correction at uh, the right time and in the right tone. Dads, in particular, but all of us, we need to realize the importance of our words. I often say things and I use the wrong tone and I find that out afterwards. I'm telling you, words are weighty. And your children, if you have them, or if you will have them, are gonna be forever impacted by your words. So, passion problems, basically it comes down to this, you reap what you sow. I mean, you're, it's going to come back to bite you eventually. You either take personal responsibility for it, or you're one of those that goes through life blaming everyone and everything else. You meet them, right? People that blame their parents, or people that blame their circumstances. No. You either own it or you blame others. And often, of course, that means you blame God. Prophetic, the purpose of prophecy here. Not everyone understands all prophecy perfectly, but we get the big picture, don't we? And the big picture is Jesus. <laughs> the big picture is that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And what uh, John means by that in Revelation 19 is that... Uh, Prophecy is meant to reveal Jesus to you. And if you don't get Jesus from prophecy, then you've missed the point. If all you get is uh, uh, a satisfaction of some curiosity that you had regarding the future, you've missed the point of prophecy. It's to reveal Jesus to you in a, a different aspect, perhaps, than you've seen him before. The purpose of prophecy is Jesus. And then, be a blessing. Again, we're not perfect examples. We never will be. But the fact of the matter is, folks, a consistent walk with the Lord and abiding in Him is really, that's the, that's the key. A consistent walk with the Lord. Don't get sidetracked by current events. I'm speaking to myself. Are you like me? Don't get sidetracked by that stuff. Walk with the Lord. And you know what? He'll guide you. He'll lead you. He'll tell you when to shut up and when to speak out. He'll show you what to do at any given moment. If you're walking with Him, you'll be in tune with Him. 
I had the opportunity to hear my father's last words because he died a slow death cancer and I took the time to spend his last hours with him and uh, I asked him personally what advice he had, what regrets he had because I wanted to get it from a dying man who knew the Lord, walked with the Lord. So some of that is, you know, too sacred to share actually. You may not have had, the, you may not have had that opportunity even to get things squared away perhaps with your father. That's okay. That's all right. But here's what I want to leave you with. You may not have an opportunity to pass your words on to your children or to other people that you want to be a blessing to. You may not have that opportunity. But you do have now. And if you don't have that opportunity, then all people will have to go on is how you live now and what you say now. Maybe you have an apology that you need to make to someone. Maybe there's someone that you need to extend forgiveness to. Maybe there is some God-appointed task that you need to get busy on. That you know that God has been speaking to your heart about, but you have been procrastinating about it. And time is running out, and you need to do it now. Maybe you've made in your mind uh, this mantra that you are going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to get to it. But you've been saying that for years and you've never gotten to it. When do you think it's going to happen if you don't do it now? Don't wait for the deathbed. <laughs> you may not have one. You may not have a deathbed blessing to pass on. So pass it on now while you can. Our Heavenly Father, I just pray that you might continue to work in our hearts these truths the passion problems that we have to admit to and take responsibility for personally Lord that we would see the future in the hands of a sovereign God in our specific unique place of contribution that you have given us life for and also O oh God that we might be bestowers of blessings upon our immediate family, our extended family, our spiritual family, the church, on others around us. That we might be a blessing to them, just like you reminded me, even this morning, in those early hours, of being a blessing to a certain uh, person. Lord, I just pray that that would uh, really characterize us while we yet have breath to speak to work to serve we pray it in Jesus name amen you don't know the Lord is your Savior no better time than now because as I said you may not have another opportunity if you don't know him trust him as your Savior it's simple as recognizing that you're a hell-bound sinner and rightly so but that Jesus took that hell for you he paid it in full on that tree when he gave his body to be pierced. His blood was shed. He poured out his life and died instead of you. You believe that? That he was buried and rose again? Then ask him to be your personal savior from sin. Invite him in your heart and life right now. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe that Jesus died for me. And I receive you, Lord Jesus, right now as my own personal Savior.